is we have to run charities like businesses. Mm. And he's like, I stuck for our brother. What do you mean? This is not mm. a business. Okay. Like, no, no, listen, you're, getting, you're un understanding the concept incorrectly. Yeah. I go, mm. the aim is that when you run something like a business, you watch every single penny you spend. Oh. Mm. I mean, you want to go and service your car. You're not going to go to the first mechanic and say, how much is it to change my brake pads? You probably make two, three phone calls, find out who's going to give you the best price and so mm. forth. So when it comes to the whole dawah, the charity side of things, why do we just accept it blindly? We need to make sure that we do it rigorously, just like a business, so we have a good you know, return on the, our investments. Inshallah. And so that was what my approach became. And Alhamdulillah, Al-Qawtha started, it mushroomed, and then all these other opportunities came up from there. So Alhamdulillah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, a great story, mashallah, but also uh, a trip down memory lane as well there, mashallah. Sajid Hussein is our special guest for this episode. Sajid has successfully launched over 12 businesses, 25 social charitable projects impacting millions and provide coaching and consultancy to numerous prominent industry leaders around the world. Sajid's businesses and projects currently span over 20 countries with new markets to be entered and projects to be delivered. He is also the author of The Gift, Young Muslim Entrepreneurs, a practical lesson on how to build a successful business. Today, we invite Sajid to talk about being a Muslim entrepreneur. The episode covers questions such as, is entrepreneurship for everyone? If so, where do you begin? How can you use the surrounding ecosystem to start a business? When should you give up on your business? And there are many more on the subject of being a Muslim entrepreneur. Come, let's hear it. And if you gain any value from the discussion, please hit the like button. <laughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yamiddin. Brothers and sisters, welcome to the Barakah Effect podcast and the topic of our discussion this week is being a Muslim entrepreneur. I hope I said that word correct, mashallah. So for this episode, we have a very special guest, a friend of mine who is the author of the book, The Gift, Young Muslim Entrepreneurs. Let us welcome the maestro himself, Sajid Hussein. Ahlan wa sahlan. Welcome, Brother Sajid. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, brothers? Alhamdulillah. 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 Mashallah. Yeah, thank you for making time with us on this podcast episode, inshallah. No problem, it was a pleasure, alhamdulillah. When I got the invites, I was like, oh, bismillah, I gotta make time for my quarantine time to be on this event, inshallah. Ah, it's still in quarantine, right? <laughs> mashallah. Yeah, in quarantine, alhamdulillah. Yeah, alhamdulillah. So first and foremost, I want to congratulate you personally on the release of your book, The Gift, mashallah. Alhamdulillah, you know, um, Spana, there's certain things in life that you always want to do and uh, um, you never get around to doing it. And uh, this was one of those things that I've had at the back of my head for several years that I want to do it. Um, the first time I actually thought about writing a book was when I was with a group of scholars in Pakistan. And um, they, we, we just finished the marriage conference and we were having breakfast in the morning and we we're just talking about the event and everything and how well it went and the impact it had. And some of the scholars turned around and said, Sajid, why don't you write a book? And I'm like, Sheikh, come on. And what, what do you mean write a book? Well, what am I going to do with writing a book? And he's like, no, write the book. Look what you do. Share this knowledge. Ever since the pandemic, they were saying to me, like, um, you know, uh, my nephews were talking about how difficult it is for them to get a job in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, not only the kind of amount of competition that is, but more importantly, the discrimination and the Islamophobia that exists mm -hmm. in the UK at the moment, especially wow. for Muslims. Wow. And um, so he was saying to me, like, you know, I can't get a job. I don't know what to do. And I was like, well, why don't you become an entrepreneur? <laughs> and he was like, well, I don't know how to do that. And I was like, well, hold on a second. You know, what do you mean you don't know how to do that? I mean, look at your life. Have a reflection on this. And then when we, after that conversation, you know, mashallah, I, I kind of engaged him. I kind of mentored him in many ways. And uh, ah. yeah, he runs a business now. And so he's not a and, uh, you know, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, and that got me thinking is like, how many other people are there? How many other Muslims are there today mm -hmm. out there in a very similar situation? Um, mm. So then, 
thought, you know what, Bismillah, let me just kind of uh, start writing the book and make the book something that will be of a benefit to others, inshallah. So yeah, that's where the gift came from. Mashallah. Yeah, that's, that's really good. I'm kind of jealous in a good way. So I hope that uh, we can also achieve the same thing. Because I had this, I have the same reaction like you. What do you mean write a book? Like, <laughs> like me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, yeah no, I just... I, I think you, should do. you should do. I mean, this is one of the things I was highlighting as well is that, you know, as well as today in society, and especially amongst the Muslims, mm. we are guilty of hoarding money. Oh, the man. other thing we are guilty of is hoarding knowledge. Oh, man. Mm. It's amazing mm. how what we go through our lives, the experiences we have, the knowledge we gain, we don't share it. Oh, it's more scary. like, oh, no, no, it's my idea. Oh, no, I keep this, uh, you know, I, I won't want to share it. Somebody else may benefit from it. Well, bismillah, your risk is already written for you. Share the knowledge, you know, let someone else benefit from it if you can't do it. And watch, the baraka comes to you even greater. Why? Because you started something that someone else inspired uh, and took action upon. So, bismillah, I think, why not? Inshallah. So, yeah, write it. If I saw bismillah, I'm looking forward to it. All right, Bismillah, Mashallah, Jazakla Khairan. <laughs> I feel more motivated now. I just finished reading it actually, and I finished reading it recently. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh man, like immediately when I finished reading, it, oh, we got to get Sajid on the podcast because people need to hear this stuff. Because a lot of us, like including most of us at the podcast itself, we kind of grew up with the kind of traditional narrative, you know, get the, get a career, uh, sorry, get a degree, get a career, get a job. Alhamdulillah, it's, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. It's just that, wow, like uh, a lot of things that uh, the world of entrepreneurship is very like a, kind of alien to us. So we want to ask so many stuff. As goes, we also want our listeners out there to kind of get that empowerment because you hinted that as well. There's a lot of perception that, oh, you either got it or you don't. Yeah, you know what, Spana, I think what it is from a very young age, we are conditioned into society, into a system. I would say not necessarily society, but more of a system. You know, for example, you have to go to school. You have to complete school. You have to gain your GCSEs, your A-levels, your degree. Otherwise, you're a failure. Mm. And there's labels that are pressures that are applied on you. And, you know, one of the things I'm interested in reading statistics about, especially in in societies like Malaysia and Singapore, the amount of pressure that children are going through at a very young age to make sure they got A's in all their exams, to make sure they got, you know... um, top levels of SATs and all sorts of, you know, um, examinations that are taking place. It's phenomenal. And it's actually leading to a lot of mental illness issues. It's leading to a lot of kind of anxiety and depression amongst children. Mm. Uh, But parents are refusing to or acknowledging this. Uh, Why? Because they want their child to be successful. Mm. Now, the question comes down to is this. Mm. How do you measure success? Is success based mm. on the house you live in or the postcode you live in or the car you drive or how big your bank account is? That's not success. These are material things that people associate with success. And that's like I was saying, the system actually has defined that for us. Mm. Let me take you guys back, say, 50 years. Did your parents have the same criteria as you have today? Was it like the same thing about going to school and getting a, you know, a good job and so forth? And let's mm. take it one generation further than that. Our grandparents, mm. would they have any similar criteria? <laughs> no. no. These type of things didn't happen, right? My parents yeah. from, were from a village. For them, success yeah. was like bread on the table, food over your head. Uh, sorry, food on the table, uh, roof over your head. Bismillah, you know, that's a success. Mm. You know, you're loving life and everything. Um, my father, Spala Mela Gim Jannah, I mean, inshallah. I mean, I mean. He was, um, you know, doing business or trading or hustling, whatever you want to call it, from the age of 12, 13. Uh. Why? Because he had to survive, you know? I mean, right. some of the schools you hear. And today, we have been put into such a cotton, you know, bud that everything has to be falling based on what society thinks our success is up. And based on that, we actually, you know, uh, put labels on to say, oh, he's a success or he's a failure and so forth. And, mm. and I think this is one of the problems that um, we are encountering today, that if you look at all the major, you know, um, guys in the business world today that most Muslims also look up to, the likes of Steve Jobs, well, I mean, he's passed away, but nevertheless, the Bill Gates, the Elon Musks, all of these guys, I mean, how many degrees do they have amongst them? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> It's true. Nothing, right? I mean, yeah. they'll tell you something. They will say, well, actually, college was a nice experience, but I didn't have the time to complete it. So you see, mm. you know, the question comes down to, and this is where it relates back to, is that what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving you as a gift? 
Mm. These people recognize their gift. They understood what they have been given, whether they were practicing or not practicing, that's beside the point. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not, you know, select people on the basis that, oh, you're a Christian, so you're not going to be given certain things. He will give. The question mm. is, how do you utilize that, what he gives you? And so, so all of us, 7.6 billion of us on this planet, every single one of us has been given a gift. Unfortunately, most of us live our life without even reflecting on what is the gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Yeah. And mm. that's the sad thing about it. I mean, to your listeners out there, you know, just take a minute, pause this podcast for a second and just ask yourself, what is the gift that Allah has given me? What is it that I have that I can share with the world? And you cannot say to me that, you know, you've been put on this planet without a gift. Everyone has a gift. A blind person who cannot see will have the gift of touch, will have the gift of smell at a higher sensory level than we would do with those who can see. Oh, Every single is a gift. You see amputated athletes competing at Paralympic Games. It's a gift. You know, how many of us could do something what they do? The reality mm. is we stop, we stop short. We undersell ourselves because we have the wrong criteria to measure success and we have no self-reflection. We just don't do that. And so these are some of the kind of, you know, um, understandings that we need to do, mashallah, to actually start our journey um, to actually change our situation, inshallah. Mashallah, love it. Yeah, just to take listeners back as well, and, and maybe to share with our brothers here as well, like how, how I got to know you. So basically, I, th I think we, you, you were leading the Al Kawthar Institute, was it, was it back then? 2009, I think? Yeah, 2009. First Al Kawthar course, November 2009, mashallah. Yeah, I just got married, so mashallah. <laughs> so yeah, I went to that very first weekend course. I remember that it was by Taufik Chaudhary, Lord of the Worlds. It was about Tawheed. And subhanAllah, I remember like attending it. I loved it. And I was, I've never attended anything quite like it. Ever since then, I made an effort to come to every single course. Like, even though we lived in Miri, I would just like fly back just to attend the course. And subhanAllah, like, I benefited so much from it. And just thinking about it, it's technically like being part of the team like for, for yourself and organizing that. Because that kind of opened the door for many other weekend courses after that. Because, you know, after that, a lot of other stuff came in, right? So that always kind of made me feel jealous. Uh, excited, like, wow, you know, this guy can start something that people follow, you know? And like one of the things that for me impacted me a lot was the, the, the Twins of Faith. That was the first one in 2011, right? Yeah. Yeah, subhanAllah. Yeah. That I really enjoyed it. That was like a dream come true for me. I back then I remember like watching videos on YouTube on Peace TV, you know, like so watching Zakir Naik and all these great speakers on stage and uh, in this auditorium. And I'm thinking, why can't we have this in Malaysia? Like, I I, I want to have this. And Subhanallah, Allah put you in that position to organize these Twins of Faith. And I, I Alhamdulillah, you gave me the chance to be I think project manager for the auditorium. <laughs> Inshallah, and that was yeah, Inshallah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was that was something else. Oh, I love it. MashaAllah. And subhanAllah, like, I, it's, when, I, when I reflect back, ever since that conference, because back then, like, it, it was the first time it was, it was done, right? And what that did was, it kind of told people that it can be done. Like, people were skeptic, right? I, I think you, you, even you shared this with us, right? People were questioning, like, oh, you know, Malaysians are not going to like this. And, you know, people were like, they, they have like a thousand reasons why this could not work. But I, I remember, whenever I'm, I remember, think about Sajid, the word, well, why not? <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's, that's the thing that's always Sajid to me. <laughs> you know, well, I, I, you know, mashallah, you've taken me down a memory lane there. And, um, and subhanAllah, you know, these are some of the things that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you to be part of, well, like, and which is an opportunity. You know, you think about it, what, there's 32 million people living in Malaysia? Yeah. yeah. And you were the auditorium manager? Where were the other 31.9 million people? Yeah. Bystanders yeah. sitting around. Right, you know, and so, and I think this is something that we once again like that self reflection. I mean, Spana, you know, if, if I go back, um, when I started on the journey of Islam itself, I actually asked myself the question I said, you know, what is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me that I can use for my deen? And I sat there and I had my coffee and I was thinking, all right, think about this, Saj, think you are not here just for the sake of it, there's a reason here. Mm. And I thought, all right, in the times of Jahaliya, I used to be an organizer. I used to put together some of the main biggest events that were taking place in London or New York mm. or Australia and something. And I thought, why don't I just take that aspect of what I know how to do well and apply that to the dean? And if that you think gift. about it, right. the gift, it's, 
Awesome. Jeff, that, you know, I, I, I literally, it came to me within minutes and I took that and then I thought to myself, okay, let me apply that to the Dean. And then a lot of these events that we did were actual events. It was about bringing people together. It was about, mm. you know, sharing something which would make, be meaningful with, and where people can connect. Mm -hmm. And so I remember, Spala, um, in the UK, we used to do a lot of the al courses, uh, mm. attend the courses, not do the courses. Mm. And I came to Malaysia in uh, October 2008. And Alhamdulillah, I was just so busy. And to be honest, I came for the dunya because I'm in the property business. It was no dawa or uh, deen related matters. It was just a better, nice people, nice environment, good food, good weather, uh, and better quality of life. So bismillah. So we decided to do hijrah, move to this country. Right. And like I said, I, I don't want to take, you know, um, you know, make it out to be something which it wasn't. It wasn't for the deen. And I got involved, I got very busy in the property field. And six months, seven months later in July, June, July, 2009, I woke up one morning and I said to my wife, I go, you know what, Spanla, we've got the dunya, but we don't have the akhira. There's something wow. missing. And she was like, what is it? I was like, I don't know. I mean, in, in the UK, we had access to, like, like you said, it's a peace TV, Islam mm -hmm. TV, lectures. We used to go attend courses and everything. And in Malaysia, the only person, mashallah, I mean, I like giving success and health as well, is Sheikh Hussein Yee who did weekend reminders at Al-Khadim on you know, Saturday and Sundays and so forth, and nothing beyond that. And it was great to attend, but then I started noticing that, you know, the enrichment means depth of knowledge. And, you know, Sheikh Hussein, mm. wasn't. So I spoke to Sheikh Hussein, I said, what about introducing some other courses here? And he was like, well, Bismillah, you know, try it. Why not? Let's see where it goes. And I spoke mm. to the guys in the UK and I said, go try it. And uh, I remember one week before the, al the course took place, I only had 15 participants. Really? Yeah, 15. <laughs> and I, wow. was speaking, I was speaking to the sheikh and I said, sheikh goes, how's it going? I go, sheikh, listen, I think we may have to cancel it. He goes, why? I go, there's <laughs> only 15 people that have registered. 15, yeah, one five, yeah? One five. And he's like, he goes, okay, so when you, I go, look, but I want to give it a few more days. <laughs> sorry, so, sorry, 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 sorry to interrupt you, Saj. Yeah. Like, I remember signing up for that. And it was me, my wife, and my mom. So if it was 15, there's only 12 besides us. Amazing. So what happened was, and check this out. So this is a weekend before the course. That same weekend, some of the volunteers that had said that they want to volunteer for the course decided not to volunteer anymore. No way. Oh, it's now within oh. the organization or the, the startup of this organization. And the brothers mm -hmm. were like, uh, Aki, we don't like what's happening. I was like, okay, please explain to me what's the problem here. Right. Oh, yeah, uh, the, the pen that you have has al Qothar written on it. I'm like, hold on oh. a second. Let oh. me get this right. You're telling me that the pen that we got made for the students to, you know, right. benefit from, so they're writing down what their notes, because it's got a logo saying al Qothar, it's a problem. They go, yeah, because the Sahabas wouldn't do that. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'm like, is this real? I mean, this is now like oh. five days before the course, right? Wow. And I'm thinking, is this real? And I'm thinking, you know what, Spanla? I, I don't know. I don't, the numbers ain't great. I'm getting this uh, huge <laughs> impact from within the team, not believing in what this is all about. Wow. And I, I asked myself, should I give up? And wow. I said, no. Oh. Bismillah, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to go ahead with this. You know, whoever turns up, turns up. What's the intention for this? It's not about making money. Mm. It's not about like, you know, making fame or anything. The whole purpose is to benefit. If three people are in the audience, three would benefit. Halas, mm. end of story. And people thought I was mad. <laughs> oh, you're paying this much for the venue and you're paying for the catering and X, Y, Z. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Bismillah, you know, everyone's got numbers in their heads. I've got like, ajad. I've been looking at rewarding money. Mashallah. Mashallah. So, uh, so that week on the Friday night, like literally a week after the conversation and all this fitna that started, on the Saturday morning, we had 152 people that turned up. <laughs> so hard, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I where they came from. Where wow. they came from. They just Na came from Nation somewhere. love. I think Nation liked uh, last minute. <laughs> yeah. It's not the, it's the last minute thing. Yeah? Well, I, I learned that. And I thought to myself, okay, this is a Malaysia thing. This is how it works here. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it came from there. And then from there, that 
152 people, the people like you face, or the people who attended that were the mouthpiece of what that whole event was about, what that mm, whole, uh, that's uh, true. whole thing was about. And then from yeah. there onwards, you know, the venues got bigger, the crowds got bigger, and yeah. humbler, the blessings got bigger as well in so many different ways. So it just shows that, you know, at every stage of your life, as you go on, it's got to have this reflection. It's like, well, okay, you know, if you think about it, the numbers weren't there. It's a good enough reason not to proceed. The cost mm -hmm. of the event, flying the sheikh in, catering for the sheikh, look in a hotel, accommodation. Right, Sheikh Taufik didn't live in Malaysia back then, didn't he? Oh, exactly. So right, all these right, scholars, right. you know, will come in, there's a cost involved there. Yeah. The, the fact that, you know, you had an internal revolt amongst the team members, <laughs> there's a fact there. And all the indicators would normally mean give up. Jump oh, ship, yeah. yeah. You know. But wallahi, you know, I said, no, I'm going to stick with it. I don't care what the outcome is going to be. I'm going to do it because my intention is sincere. And That's this nice. is what I always say to myself. If you think that you are doing something for the sake of Allah, then be prepared to be tested. Mm. Because there is no way you're going to be able to do something without being tested. And the test will come in different ways. Different Sometimes ways. they all come in different directions as well. It's sure. how strong your resolve is. And Alhamdulillah, through this whole journey, mashallah, um, you know, Al Kotha became what it became. It spread from Malaysia, went to Indonesia, went to uh, uh, Pakistan, and obviously around the world as well. But that, that's my point in so many of these things. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I highlighted this as well, like one of the brothers I was speaking to, and, and I was saying, look, what we have to understand is we have to run charities like businesses. Mm. And he's like, I stuck for our brother. What do you mean? This is not mm. a business. Okay. Like, no, no. Listen, you're get you're un understanding the concept incorrectly. Yeah. I go. Mm. The aim is that when you run something like a business, you watch every single penny you spend. No. Mm. The, I mean, you want to go and service your car. You're not going to go to the first mechanic and say, "How much is it to change my brake pads?" You probably make two, three phone calls, find out who's going to give you the best price, and so mm. forth. So when it comes to the whole dawa, the charity side of things. Why do we just accept it blindly? We need to make sure that we do it rigorously, just like a business, so we have a good you know, return on the, our investments. Inshallah. And so that was what my approach became. And Alhamdulillah, al Kotha started, it mushroomed, and then all these other opportunities came up from there. So Alhamdulillah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, a great story, mashallah, but also uh, a trip down memory lane as well there, mashallah. Yeah, mashallah, it's it's so amazing hearing that side of the story because I, I came and like, because I didn't know you back then and uh, I came like a full auditorium and I'm like, wow, where did these guys get the connections, man? These guys, <laughs> these guys are good, man. <laughs> mashallah. But so hearing it from that side, wow, mashallah. But you see, even the authorities, right? I had a good, uh, had a good uh, conversation with them. So I thought, right, well, number, my number one rule is don't compete, just compliment. Ah, right? So whenever, yeah. whichever country I go into, you know, do not question what's happening, right? Because the moment you start questioning it is the moment you're seen as a threat. So uh, everything is be more like, you know, okay, Bismillah, educate me, teach me, guide me, advise me, and then let me see if I can contribute or help towards, you, you know, what's happening in this society. Mm, Straight away, that. you build rapport. There's no threat. People are very accepting. So mm. when I asked them about, um, you know, doing an Al-Gortha course, and, you know, mm. Malaysian authorities are like, Mm, what's he trying to do here? Who's he going to brainwash and so forth? And, <laughs> yeah. and they go, oh, no, no, we have all these rules and all this stuff and nothing, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay. And I thought, all right, they're feeling threatened. So I said, okay, Sheikh, please, uh, you know, I really appreciate this. So can you help me um, and highlight what I can't do? Oh. He goes, okay. Wow. And um, so I reversed it. And he goes, all right, you can't have a... Um, a, a Malay speaker. I go, okay, no problem. My speakers are international. He goes, you can't have a, a, a public event. I go, no problem. I'm having a private ticketed event. All right? He goes, you can't have it uh, in an open venue. I go, no problem. I'm doing it in private venues. He goes, you can't have uh, long-term courses. I go, no problem. I'm having a two-day short-term course. He goes, you can't have it in Malay. I go, no problem. I'm doing it in English. Mm. Goes, okay. <laughs> So I go, is that a problem then in any of them? He goes, uh, no. I go, okay, Bismillah, thank you so much for the wow. meeting. <laughs> you know what I mean? So wow. here's, there's two approaches to this. There's one approach is give me your full SOP on what I can't do or can <laughs> do. Or there's another way of reversing it and just say, right, tell me what I can't do. 
And he goes, you can't do this. I go, okay, that's that's your main thing. Yeah, so if you don't check the boxes, does that mean I can by by <laughs> by oh, shoot? By oh, default, you, you're perfectly fine. So, wow. and because of that, they gave us a green light and that's how we went on. So, um, so but that's Allah the thing. Allah. That's my point. It's a system, right? Mm. Like I was talking about. It's everything that we have around us is a system. And especially mm. places like Malaysia. I was speaking to... Uh, um, I was in Tanzania uh, on safari with my wife once, and um, what happened was we were sitting in this lodge by this British kind of uh, old aristocrat who, who owned the lodge, and we're having dinner. And he, when he asked everybody, where are you from, and this and that, and he asked myself and my wife, where are you from? We were from the UK. He goes, ah, oh, the British. I was like, okay. I mean, not that I see myself as one on that scale, but he then goes, okay. goes you know what? He goes, you know what you left with the world once you were colonial powers? And I was like, no, enlighten me. He goes, bureaucracy. And I was thinking, he goes, you may not be seen as a master's, but you are still the master's controlling what's going on in the Commonwealth. And when I look around, every single Commonwealth country has got major bureaucracy. And Malaysia is not separate. It's, it's part of it. The bureaucracy in this country is crazy. I mean, we have an SLP for everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like yeah, you see yeah. SLP, wash your hand, SLP, you know, how to greet SLP on everything. I was like, what the? So with everything, what you need to do is, and especially these kind of places, it's about understanding the system. Because the moment you understand the system, you'll be able to work the system. But the moment you don't, and try to make a difference, you're going to get closed down. They're going to lock you out. They're going to push you out. And they're going to you know, make it very difficult for you to do anything. And I say this as number one advice, especially to a lot of my team members around the world, or especially brothers who are doing hijra and moving to a different country, because they always have this expectation. Oh, but it's a Muslim country. They should be doing it. I'm sorry, no. What makes you say that? What makes mm, you think that? Just yeah. because it's a Muslim country doesn't mean that there's all this openness about it. You have to understand there's different communities, there's different cultures, there's different procedures. So don't come as a tourist where everything is, oh, mashallah, click, click, you know, Facebook, social media. Yeah. Come and understand the system. Mm. So that's another lesson, inshallah. Mashallah. Wow. It's, it's amazing, you know, speaking about this, like we were speaking about how you started Kautha and pretty much the, 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 the backstory behind it, the origin story behind it. But if we pick apart the what you, the what you applied in this journey, there's so much of that that we can apply inside the entre- entrepreneur entrepreneurship idea, which you spoke about in your book. I mean, you, in this venture alone, you talk about how you in- overcome those internal fears and doubts, those uh, naysayers even internally, and kind of the, the persistence to keep going. And when you meet dead ends, the the classic "why not" subject <laughs> comes out again. And I love that point about like what you can't do. And also another point about understanding the system as well and building rapport. I think it's somehow like people, when they look at, like for example, Islamic events, they look at Islamic events as Islamic events, but the the building blocks that make up the success of that, pretty much the same thing. Can I, can I say that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, look, one thing that um, we are guilty of is we lack excellence in what we do. Mm. You know, whatever we do, you know, we don't give it 100%. I would rather spend extra for my own pocket to make sure something is done with excellence than it is where it's half-heartedly or sugar-coated mm. because people recognize excellence. And mm. when you do it with excellence, you start creating a benchmark and then people then have to compete to that. And I think this is what the journey has you know, engaged us with because as Muslims, mashallah, not only do we have a beautiful religion and a deen that empowers us to be the best, and the, you know, the Prophet ﷺ has told us, he goes, do what you do with excellence. Then why do we you know, cut corners? Why do we make things that look good, but at the end, behind the scenes, they're very fragile or they're just like, you know, um, not, as, um, not as beneficial for those who attend. So for my philosophy and a lot of this type of stuff is that Make sure application of excellence is there. I mean, you think about it, the very first course, Al Kotha course, why even spend the money to have a pen with a logo on it? <laughs> True. <laughs> I, I could have just said, forget it. Okay, I got too much fitness happening amongst the team members. 
let me just forget it, let not bother with it. But no, excellence. Because now every single person that takes that pen with them and they write with that pen, there's a reward that comes to you for it. You know, and when they look at it, and okay, so you obviously were there, you know, people saw it, the way it was conducted, the way it was managed, the way it was, you know, um, executed. When people see that, they appreciate that because you can't cut corners, you know, and, mm-hmm. you know, the folders today, when I speak to people, they still have their folders in their offices and their, you know, you know their houses. And they're like, look at this, I still got my folders. I'm like, oh, I, I, got a, I got a bunch of folders here in Miri, Sheikh. I brought it, I flew it all the way here. <laughs> I still yeah, refer to them. You still have them, right? Yeah, Why? Yeah. Because... These are, you know, moments, experiences. You open that folder, you flick through some pages, oh, yeah. you see the notes, you're thinking, Spanla, you know, yeah. I still refer to them, you know, from yeah. time to time as well. Yeah. But it's all that excellence. It's having to do what you do. And I think that's what makes it, um, especially in the entrepreneurial field, that when you do it, it gives people the uh, sense and the belief and plus trust that mm. this person or this organization is doing something which is going to be different or it's going to be with quality and people mm. want quality. Nobody wants anything fake. Everybody wants a good quality, you know, um, bag and good quality, you know, um, material aspects as well as like, you know, in terms of services. So yeah, definitely. And I think this is important to, you know, highlight that because there's, there's a whole range of traits in entrepreneurship that an entrepreneur needs to have. And, and, and these are the type of things like, you know, whether it's like, um, Attitude, you know, with the, all the adversity, it was the attitude I had to f- drive through it and still deliver, which mm-hmm. made a difference. It's having the, you know, um, self-discipline to actually make sure that you're going to still do what you say you're going to do. It's having the kind of, you know, um, ensuring that you put excellence in how you do things. Now, you may say, well, I'm starting a business. I don't have that. And this you do. Your presentation, there's an excellence about it. You know, your delivery, the, the product you're trying to do, um, the, your engagements, every aspect of your business growth, your startup will have an excellence towards it. And that's important. And there's a whole range of other traits as well, inshallah, that we'll cover. Yeah, subhanAllah. Excellence is something that, you know, it's universal. Right? People see it, it. It oozes out from you. It's contagious. I remember a quote saying that people, people forget what you said. They'll forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And yeah. excellence is something that, wow, you know, it just leaves a mark on you. And subhanAllah, that, that's exactly what I got when I attended the first Al-Kawasa course. <laughs> I remember even the the, the course, uh, the, the flyers themselves, they look like movie trailers, you know, like really well-made stuff, you know, mashallah. And subhanAllah, that, that really got me thinking because, uh, I mean, of course, we're speaking about entrepreneurship, but also, also talking about da'wah and Islam events in general. There's a lot of like uh, the, the tendency to go like, oh, you know, it's just for the sake of Allah, you know, khalas, now why, why should we spend money doing this and this? But I, as a participant myself, attending those events, I know that that leaves a mark on me. I'm like, wow, this is a brand I can trust. I want to come again. Exactly. I think that's important. And one of the key things I say to a lot of business uh, entrep- up- upcoming entrepreneurs is create an identity, right? Because when you want to start any business, you don't really know what that business is going to be in its full entirety. Mm, so the very first thing I do personally is once I have an idea, I create an identity for that idea. Mm, so that. I go to a designer. I said, right, this is an idea. Create me a logo. And so they play with the designs. This and that. The moment they create a logo and then I print that logo and I'm looking at it, I go, now I have something to aim at. Ah. So what you do is you create an identity and this idea was just an idea. All mm. of a sudden, this idea has an identity. Wow. Now, you have purpose to make this identity come to life. Yeah. And, and it doesn't mean that, you know, just you, it will happen within a week or a month or a year. It's up to you how long you want to develop that. But the point is, you now have an identity. And that changes everything, your mind, your attitude, your approach um, towards making this business startup or this business idea come to life and that's very very key so yeah to all the listeners out there you know if those who are wanted to become entrepreneurs and they don't know where to start start with an identity for your product or your service any Mm. logo anything that you think is relevant there's plenty of examples out there take something modify it or create something from scratch but once you have that in your hand i mean when i say physically i'm talking if you don't have a business card printed Make it, uh, you know, print it off on a, 
you know, photocopy or, you know, print of a printer or something and look at it, hold it in your hand and say, okay, that belongs to me. That's mine. Wow. And that changes your whole approach to things. So, wow. yeah. Wow. I would say that um, key in the very first step for so many people. Yeah, we had that in the question. If, what, what, where would we start if you want to start as an entrepreneur? So identity, so that, that's, that's the key takeaway here. And as well, I, I remember like just, just to share with the audience, our meet, pre-meeting before this podcast itself, we spoke about the title itself, right? And that, that kind of alludes to the idea of identity. So the initial uh, pro- I, uh, title that I proposed was being a Muslim entrepreneur. And then you mentioned something about right. how said, this is limited. Yeah, I, so becoming. I want to hear your point. Uh, yeah. Sorry, becoming, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it was becoming. Original title, yeah. It's becoming. Yeah. So, so yeah, maybe you want to share with us again. Like, I, I found that really powerful. Like, that that also segues into the idea of identity itself. So, the idea about self-limiting beliefs. So, can you maybe just share that back with us? Like, what, what is what is this issue about if we call ourselves becoming a Muslim entrepreneur? That's what I am. Right? I'm trying to become one, right? Yeah, look, <clears throat> Smana, what, like I said, uh, words are, you know, just labels. And when you pick the wrong label you actually restrict yourself uh, or you create self-limiting boundaries that you may not realize, mm. but you, you do that. Uh, your subconscious, because you, you've got two minds, right? You've got your conscious mind and you've got your subconscious mind. Yeah. You can tell your subconscious mind that you're an astronaut and your subconscious mind will believe it. So if <laughs> I said to you guys right now, you know, tell your subconscious mind that you're going to, in 2025, fly to Mars. Mm. Right, you've just told your subconscious mind, I'm going to fly to Mars. You've seen a rocket, you've seen that journey of space, and this and that. You get to Mars in your astronaut suit. Your subconscious mind does not know whether that's real or not, it will do what you tell it to do. (laughs) Simple as that, right? You tell your subconscious mind now that I'm going to go out next week and I'm going to buy myself a Ferrari because I found like oil underneath my house. Those images have just run through your head very easily. You've seen the oil, you've seen your house, you've seen a Ferrari, and you, what, you, what have you done? Your subconscious mind thinks, okay, that's exactly what's going to happen. You can tell your subconscious mind to do whatever you want to do. The question is, those who are entrepreneurs or the, the visionaries, they work with their subconscious mind, and their subconscious mind keeps on planting this within them. Now, like any athletes, what is the thing they do? It's practice. It's consistency. You want to be a best footballer. You want to be a best ice skater, whatever it may be. They repeat, they practice, they practice, they train, they train, they train, they train. Mm -hmm. When you train your brain to do something similar, it automatically begins to accept it. So if you tell your brain enough times, I'm going to be an astronaut, your brain will think, okay, you're an astronaut. Halas, bismillah. Now what? Then you go on your educational journey and find the funding to become an astronaut, whatever it may be. It's the same thing that applies in terms of entrepreneurship or in terms of any business that you do. Once you tell your brain that, okay, I am, you know, a business person, I'm a businessman, or you tell your brain, I am going to produce like, um, I don't know, um, the next generation of mobile phones, whatever the product or the service is, the more you tell your brain that this is what you are going to do, the more your brain will actually accept it. And this is the same, you know, uh, the same kind of um, strategy in many ways, but also the same type of uh, uh, self-belief that when you say to yourself enough times, your brain accepts it and then you act upon it. Then it becomes a natural thing for you to do because it's no longer alien for you. You think, oh, that's normal. Okay, Uh, my brain is okay. I'm comfortable with it. It's when your brain doesn't know something like that, oh, I don't want to be an astronaut, I don't feel comfortable with that, oh, all the training and everything like that, then your mind is telling you conflicting-wise. So there's the same thing in many ways that when it comes to um, being an entrepreneur and doing the things and delivering them, so you've got this idea, you've created an identity about it, then you have to start visioning it. You have to tell your subconscious mind that, okay, in three months' time, I'm going to have my first prototype. In six months, I'm going to do my marketing. In you know, one year from now, I'm going to be launching at some trade show, X, Y, Z, whatever it may be. And then what you've done is you've trained your brain to start thinking that way. I mean, my own example, um, when I was writing the book, The Gift, uh, the first thing I did was I went on a course to understand what it takes to be a, um, an author because 
I've heard of people being an author, but I didn't know what it entails, you know, some of that, and learned a few skills. And I, once I did that, the first, the second thing I did, I created myself a brand. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, it's a, pro- a product itself. Let me create a logo for it. So I created a logo for it and I liked my logo. And I thought, you know what, Bismillah, I like it. I'm going to do my book. And so every time I looked at my logo, it drove me to write my book. It kept on driving me on a daily basis to make sure I write my book, write a few words, and at least, you know, get it complete by a deadline I have. I started from the day I finished my course and I got my logo telling my wife, I'm an author. Uh, And she's like, but hold on a second, you haven't written anything. I was like, I know, but I'm still an author. And then I wrote uh, one sentence. Look, I've written a sentence. I'm an author. Right. And as I went along, you know, everyone I speak to, I say, I'm an author, I'm an author, I'm an author. And wow. that sort of belief allowed me to then bring this together. Right, mashallah, Allah mubarak. See what I mean? Because yep. what happens, you are just training your brain constantly to believe that what you want to achieve, you will achieve. Mm. The question then comes, you get the motivation, you get the drive, you get the passion, you find a purpose, and then bismillah, you drive, you know, you aim towards it. So these are the type of uh, general skills that I think, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs who want to be an entrepreneur. And I mean, that's why I was saying your question about becoming a Muslim entrepreneur or being a Muslim entrepreneur. Becoming puts conditions on it. Mm. Oh, you know, I'll become an astronaut. Well, you know, <laughs> we all can become something. But why, why put condition on it? Why not say I... Oh, you know, I am an astronaut. I, I'm being an, uh, an entrepreneur, right? Mm-hmm. So what happens, it gives it life, you know, and you guys can, you know, just put in those two words. If you ask yourself, uh, you know, uh, like those of you who are single will say, I, you know, I, I want to get married. So when you say I want to, what you're saying is I want to, but. Oh, blah, blah, okay. Blah, blah. Right. Money, I need a house, I need approval, I need a wife, you know, and this, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right. yeah. compared to say, uh, I am getting married. Mm. Now, automatically, I am changes the whole thing to say that, okay, oh, he's found a wife, he's found a car, he doesn't have any issues, he's ticked all the boxes. You may not have. Mm. What have you done? You put your mind into a more positive positioning to say, I am getting married which gives you that drive and the passion to say, okay, Bismillah, I am get- when am I getting married? I'm going to get married by, like, you know, May. Okay. Yeah. So then that drives you to kind of do that. And the same way about becoming an entrepreneur or being an entrepreneur, the question is, it's all attitude, you know? And if you can start oh. thinking about these words and say, what is a better alternative? Why do I put it into a unknown, subjective kind of context compared to a more certain, def- definite context, mm. you know, that will actually change your approach in how you're targeting, you know, your ventures or starting your businesses uh, or even other things in life, right? Because mm. they're all interacted in that sense. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, subhanAllah, that's, that's really deep because I remember reading about this as well, about the concept of identity in the book, Atomic Habits, uh, where the author of James Clear was saying that, you know, people like, they like to focus on the outcomes, but the thing is, if you want something done, you start with the identity first. That identity will give rise to those habits that eventually gets you the outcome that you want. So subhanAllah, like I'm just tying all these things together. But you know, maybe just taking it a step back now. Like, okay, so let's say now we've, we've started, we've got the identity now. And we've kind of had that vision now, who we want to be. But there's always something that holds people back, which is fear. Fear of failure, fear of not knowing whether this venture is going to succeed, fear of how am I going to sustain myself? Like, you know, how am I going to find the money to do that? What if I, you know, how do I know it's going to be profitable? So I just want to know, like, how do you confront this, this fear of failure? And, you know, does that, do you feel these things yourself when you go through these ventures? See, I mean, with failure, I mean, so first of all, fear. Um, I've had a slightly different approach to fear. Um, some fears I decide to face, face on. Um, for example, I was scared of heights. And so what did I do? I jumped out of a plane, right? So <laughs> right. Oh. <laughs> I was, okay, so I, you know, I jumped out of a plane. So then I was scared of sharks. And so what did I do? I jumped in a cage and went diving with a great white shark. <laughs> okay. So there's certain things, you know, um, that fears you stop doing something because 
that you always have this mindset um, or this emotional uh, feeling about the that it's not going to be a negative experience. Yeah. I jumped out of plane. I landed on the ground. That fear of heights went straight away. Wow. I went, I went into the water. I, I faced a great white shark coming towards me. He went past me. Alhamdulillah. I was in a cage, by the way. I wasn't free diving or anything. Yeah. But the point is, with all these fears... It's a natural process. It's a natural emotion. We all have it. You know, mm. sometimes we have a fear of like um, losing your job or sometimes you have a fear of like um, breakdown in relationships. Or, But a, a lot of it's just paranoia. But mm. let's remember, where does fear come from? It comes from the shaitan. Because the shaitan doesn't want you to do something, especially when it's something that's going to be like uh, life-changing or especially religiously, you know, beneficial. Mm. So the shaitan is always going to say, oh, don't do that. Oh, that's not going to be good for you. Your family's not going to be happy. Your parents are going to be upset that you've quit your job and decide to like, you know, start your own business or whatever it may be. Yeah. So the first thing is, is like, you're never going to be able to remove all your fears. And it's not good to do so. It's always good to have fear because fear will keep you in check. What you need to do is learn to manage your fears. Mm. And by that, what you do is you create options. You create options and scenarios in all these kind of scenarios, right? And then mm -hmm. you start working through it and say, okay, well, that works for me. It's, I'm more comfortable with this option. And so what do you do? You start mitigating fear. It's because mm -hmm. we don't mitigating look fear. at options is where we just get stuck. Oh, no, right, I can't, right. do that. I can't leave my job and start a business. Can't do both things at the same time. Uh, why not? Of course you right. can. You know, I mean, right. that famous why not, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> really, I mean, it's just the way we are. We, our brains not function to think in that way because all these years, our conditioning has been such that da, 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 you go through this, you get that, you get yourself a job, you become a modern, modern day part of slavery. And then, you know, you pay your bills and, you know, be happy. And that's mm. the end of it. Yeah. I mean, seriously, is that life? That's not mm. life. That's a simple slavery. Mm. Right? So a lot of it comes down to is this whole aspect of fear, like you've very you know, well highlighted. And I think it's a very important aspect, and especially for the, a lot of the listeners out there. You know, there's so many things in life that you want to do, but you just don't do them because of this fear. Fear of traveling. Oh, no. What's it going to be like? What these new cultures, you know, will they accept me? Am I going to stand out? Is it scary this and that i remember i did the marriage conference in south africa and um i'm speaking to some of the top scholars uh, around the world um, and they're saying isn't it dangerous to go to south africa and i was like yeah it is but we're not going to be walking around the streets of like johannesburg right in like you know uh the shanty towns or in the ghettos and everything you know, you're going to be hosted. You will have people who know the city who are going to be traveling with you, X, Y, Z. And so mm. straight away, there was an element of fear. Why? Because the media said that Johannesburg is in the top six worst cities in the world. Mm. Alhamdulillah, every one of them is alive and breathing today. Every one of them loves South Africa, especially Johannesburg, the people, the community and everything. But it's that fear. Right. Now, if you have a certain fear and not do something, the only thing you're going to get from that is regret. Because mm, later on in life, it's going to come back and hit you. It's going to say, why didn't I do that? Mm. You know, I was a, such a good idea or it was a just great opportunity and I didn't do that. Yeah. So it's not about, you will never ever be able to eliminate fear because it's an emotional response. Your brain triggers this certain thing. You're never going to put your hand into the mouth of a snake. It's not going to happen, right? right? And there's a natural fear there. But how do you mitigate that? Yeah. Speaking Once of you, speaking of snakes, Jeff, I remember the, the, the chapter in your book, titled Phobia, about snakes, isn't it? About the animal man when you were eight years old, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I see it here right now. The snake did not do anything to me. It was my own mind that created that fear. He overthought the fear. Exactly. Well, like, it's so true. I mean, and for those listeners who haven't had the opportunity to know what Faisal was referring to, it's like, um, I had a fear of snakes for 35 years. Wow, and all started off at school, like you know, like Faisal said that I was very excited. The animal man was coming, and the eagle came, and like you know, uh, various other animals. And so we're all lined up, and I'm waiting for the snake to come. 
And as the animal man's walking past us, uh, he just ends up like stopping and the snake turned its head and just looked at me and I just froze. Mm. And from that moment onwards, my con- subconscious mind just became like, oh my God, that's, I hate snakes. Okay. And for years and years and years, years, right, I, I, I would so petrified with snakes that if I saw a documentary on TV, I would switch it off or I'd turn the channel. That's how wow. much of a... It's yeah, that bad, yeah. <laughs> that bad. Well, I think it that bad, right? Because we always see snakes as negative, right? As a dangerous animal or de- reptile uh, and so forth. And this is all about cognitive behavior. How do you change your mindsets? How do you use certain techniques to overcome certain self-limiting beliefs? And so when I did this in 2017... Um, when I was in the, um, uh, in the course, in the classroom, the practitioner, the, the trainer said, anybody got a phobia here? And I said, actually, I have of snakes. He goes, well, okay, come to the front. So he goes, so what happens when you have a phobia? Uh, what, what's your fear about? I go, well, I just get frightened when I see, fear, fearful when I see snakes. So he goes, so what would you do if there was a snake here today? I go, I'll probably crap myself. And he goes, okay, because we've got one here. And I was like, you what? He goes, yeah, we have one. <laughs> no <And> way. <laughs> so they brought a snake out into the classroom behind the glass. And I'm like, no way. I was like, what are you doing here? He goes, so you, how do you feel? I go, no, I'm getting sweaty right now, right? I'm getting hot. And he goes, okay, what if the snake just stays there? And there was someone holding the snake. And they go, what if he stays there? And, you know, would he be okay? I go, oh, yeah, if it's as long as it's that distance, I'm okay. And then he starts working on me. And then he basically says to me, okay, like, you know, I want you to, you know, just relax. And I'm like, how can I relax when there's a snake out there? Like, <laughs> right. So he's like, no, no, I just want you to relax. And I want you to kind of start thinking, you know, open your subconscious mind. And then basically what it is, there's a technique called fast phobia technique, where what it is, you do not look at the actual event. You look before the event and after the event, you change the event features. So if it's color, you make it black and white. If it's slow motion, you make it fast. If there's noise, you make it like a music or whatever. And this is all the stuff you do in your brain. And so what happens is you go through this reverse motion where that event itself that caused the fear, you don't care what that event is. It could, it could be anything. It could be a car crash. It could be a trauma. It could be a major incident in your life. But mm. you don't care about the event. You just die, you change the attributes of that event. And by doing that, it took 15 minutes. And he goes, how do you feel? I go, well, I feel perfectly fine. He goes, can the snake, you know, can the woman, his uh, assistant, bring the snake in? I go, yeah, sure, no problem. Wow. And, the snake, and literally, wallahi, I'm not lying to you, brothers. Um, within minutes, I had the snake around my arm. I'm so stalking fine. the snake. It's just moving around me. It's going over me and this and that. And I'm like, perfectly fine. Not a sweat, not a fear. I'm just playing with it. And I'm thinking for 35 years, I created this self-limiting belief in my head. And I did nothing about it. And this was like one of my greatest fears from all the things. And here I am playing with it. I mean, I'm not going to go around and play with a cobra. I'm not stupid, right? So (laughs) what I'm saying is that what happened in 15 minutes to change my mind? Wow, subhanAllah. That's the power of the brain. That is what we have. That's what the gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us is this akal. Think, use your brain. But how many of us have even stopped to think how the brain works? Mm. How do we function this? You know, what are the kind of things that um, we need to understand that every time we come to a certain situation in life, it's our brain that can help change our understanding of that moment, overcome your fear, overcome your self-limiting beliefs, and then move on from there, inshallah. Inshallah. Well, I love this point. So, so the thing about fear, right? So when, when people talk about, you know, starting a venture, starting a business, so the thing about like all these overthinking thoughts and these self-limiting beliefs and all these things. So the, the typical response to fear that people always have in their heads is that it's either two extremes. It's either you run away from it, like don't look at it ever again, kind of like the snake that you had for 35 years, or the other extreme is kind of just face it head on, like a reckless, you know, kind of like, a, you know, don't think about it. But what you're saying here is, it's not. It's neither of the two. It's really about breaking it down. What's the worst that could happen? You know, like, like planning risk mitigation, and 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 working around it, and then just taking it step by step, and you know, take, like eating the frog, right? Kind of piece by piece. So can I put it that way? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, like I said, we always think of the extremes. That's what happens, right? Yeah, so yeah. When, you, when you take it and say, well, okay, what's the worst that can happen? You know, maybe I can take the venture to a certain stage and then I need to, I mean, like that happens, right? Look at businesses. Mm. You create your idea, you create a concept, you build a, you know, a, an identity, you move it onto a, the next stage, maybe as a prototype, you need funds. You hit a roadblock. Where are you going to get the money from? Okay, mm. now, if you believe in it, other people will believe in it. Let's find investors. Let's find, you know, venture capitalists. Let's find something. So mm. there's a block after block after block. The question comes down to it is, don't take it all on in one go. Take it in bite size. Deal with this, then move mm. on. Deal with that, then move on. Then deal right. with the next, then move on. And that's right. how you move. And so what would happen eventually is, even though other people will not believe in what you're doing, you will have so much self-conviction and belief that you will say, Bismillah, I, I don't care about whether you believe or not. I'm still going to do it. Mm. And, and you still progress. And, and guess what? Most people, I mean, in the business world, in Silicon Valley, they don't care about what the idea is. They care about the person who's doing the idea. Oh. So when they say, people don't invest in the idea, they invest in the person. Huh. And that's very, very key. Wow. Because when they look at you, they look at you and they think, look at this person. He's willing to give his job up. He's willing to give his, you know, change his environment. He's take on these challenges just because he believes in that. Wow. Because of that, we want to invest in him. That's what it happens. And I, this is a feedback I've got from so many investors from around the world. Is like, you know what? It's because of, you know, your approach to things that gives us the trust and the belief that, yes, this project's going to succeed. Wow. Otherwise, just an idea. How do they know that idea is a great idea? They wow. don't. If they, they look at you, what drives that idea. So for those wannabe or those who are Muslim entrepreneurs, this is a, a key lesson. It comes down to you. You have to be convincing enough, have enough self-belief to stand and say, hey, this is going to make the change the world. This is going to be different. This is going to have global implications, right? On something wow. positive that you want to introduce. Only then... Or the people who see you will say, ah, now we believe in what this guy's got to say. And mm. Bismillah, off you go from there. Hmm. I wow. actually have a, I have a kind of uh, question for you about that one. I, I want to ask that you launched many businesses yourself, right? So how do you know it will be profitable? Just like see, you said. That's an excellent question, Aki. You know, um, I had a friend of mine, he said to me, he goes, uh, Sajid, let's have a coffee. I go, okay, Bismillah. You offer me coffee, I've got time for you. And so, <laughs> okay, uh, that's the tip. Huh? We met up. Yeah, so not, not Starbucks coffee, brother, right? Let me not okay. call. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, you know. Honestly. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> what happened was we, we met up. I go, okay, what's up? He goes, listen, I've got an idea. I go, what's your idea? He goes, there's the corporate event that happens in North America and Europe, but there's nothing that takes place in Southeast Asia. We can bring that event together here and we can make a lot of money. And I was like, okay, what are the numbers? He goes, it's a three day event and you can charge up to 10 to 15,000 US dollars per participant. Wow. Uh, okay. Interesting. So he gave me the breakdown. He goes, look, you do events, you've done events, blah, blah. You know, all of this background, let's set up a business. Let's start this. It'll be great. All this type of stuff. Then, after he finished, I said, he goes, what do you think? I go, look, I have one question for you. He goes, what is it? I go, how does this business bring me closer to my Akira? Mm -hmm. So he went quiet. And he went, he goes, um, all right. He goes, look, the money you make, you can use it for dawah purposes. I go, look, understandable, fair enough. But I go, how am I making that money? I go, if someone's going to come for $10,000 for a three-day corporate event, they're not going to sit here and drink lassi. They're not going to have a, like a, a soft juice. They want to be wined and dined. If I'm going to be making my money because it's going to be whining and dining these corporate heads from around the world, am I happy with this? This is what oh. I want to do? So what it is, I created myself a litmus test. My litmus test is simple. Whatever I do... I do it so there's a benefit and it's going to make a difference for me on, in the world of, uh, on the day of judgment. Because mm. I have no idea that, I mean, the dunya is easy, brother. You know, you can go out and start millions of business ideas and try to make money from that, bismillah. But the question comes down to, is the, 
If you, that's what you want, you will get it. But if you want the reward for the Akhirah, that changes your whole mindset. So a lot of these projects I've done, every single project, and I can say categorically every single project in the last 10 years has always been about how do I make this project which is going to give me benefit on the day of judgment? Mm. Not about how much money I'm going to make. Because the moment you chase the dunya, the dunya will run away from you. But the moment you change, chase the akhira, the dunya will chase you. And people start realizing that. People start seeing that. They think, what a great idea. I mean, somebody said to me, you're doing the marriage conferences. You're not making money. Mm. Why are you doing it? Mm. I go, look at the number of lives we're impacting. We have up to 5,000 people that attend one marriage conference in South Africa, almost 2,000 here in Malaysia. I've had thousands attending in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Pakistan, in the UK. You know, whenever we've done a marriage conference, there's thousands and hundreds and thousands of people that turn up and everything. And all the millions of people that watch it on TV and everything. I've been stopped in foreign countries in the middle of a shopping mall and saying, are you Brother Saji? That's like, yeah, who are you? Do I owe you any money? You know, what's the story? Like, no, no, you did an event. I just want to let you know that my friend attended and now they got married. Or I've seen couples oh, in Malaysia, wow. well, he stopped me, who said, oh, Brother Sajid, you may not recognize us, but we came to your marriage conference and, and this is where I met my wife and this is your nephew. And I'm looking at this kid and I'm thinking, <laughs> wow, you see, you have no idea the impact you make. But Allah subhanahu wow. ta'ala will send you from time to time a reminder to say, hey, listen, you know what you did? This is a result of it. That just motivates you to continue. So with all of these things, the question comes down to is, whether they make the money or not, it's about the impact it creates. And for me, my litmus test is, I want to stand on the day of judgment and I want to see scales which are heavy in my favor. And I will like, where did they come from? And it's because mm -hmm. you did such and such, which resulted in such and such impact. And that's why the scales are heavy, inshallah. Now, naturally, sustainability has to be a key part of it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of businesses, you know, you just can't go blindly and just keep on funding them. So you have to create a model which is going to allow the business to generate revenue. You have to create a framework and everything. Right. A lot of the issues that a lot of the charities today or businesses today have is that they do not look at the ecosystem that they're trying to address. The ecosystem, so, okay. The ecosystem. This is something that a lot of people overlook completely. Now, arguments like... Um, Let's talk about a, a business concept. You want to give somebody a new tablet, like, you know, on the market, this and that. You are looking on selling that tablet. What you do look at is primarily the kind of price range, who's going to be able to afford it and everything like that. Right. Very, very few people look around the whole ecosystem to understand who are the main players that will be coming into that ecosystem or are part of that ecosystem. And... When you look at the ecosystem of the product or the service you're involved in, it will open up far, far more opportunities for you than what you are country currently looking at and focusing on. That's a big, big issue that we have, especially with charities. Because if you look at charities, what do they do? They go and serve the need of what the hour is. Let's take this example ah, in Malaysia. Right okay, subhanAllah. Malaysia, there's floods, right? Yeah. SubhanAllah, may Allah protect this country and the people of it. With these people who are suffering from floods, the Malaysian charities, the main priority is to give them a place to stay and give them like, um, you know, some food or something. That's probably the most they're doing. What's the ecosystem? The whole ecosystem is now let's look at where these people came from. Did these people have a certain background? Yes, they were working and they lost their houses or they were refugees or they were like low class workers or foreign migrants or whatever it may be. When you start looking at the ecosystem, you start identifying so many more areas where help is needed. Because the question is, there's always going to be the person at the front that you're feeding or you're giving help to. But if you can fix the issues from behind or around these people, then you wouldn't need to give out handouts anymore. Mm -hmm. Charities don't do that. Charities just look at the final recipient. Who is that recipient? This is where we need to start changing the mindsets and how we are dealing with these type of things. And as an entrepreneur, if you look into the ecosystem you're serving, 
you are opening up a huge opportunity of market which you know you would normally close yourself off to you don't realize that hey hold on a second from this whole market if i tap this section of the market i can get in there much much easier than this section you see what i mean um here's an example uh, the concept of body bags this is mm. one of my projects i've launched recently and you know um it's embarrassing for my wife like she's like um I can't tell my friends you're in the business of debt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you know, there's only guarantee in life is death, right? And taxes. <laughs> and taxes. So, okay. And taxes. So, you know, body bags is uh, an aspect of it. You know, it's about giving dignity to the dead and everything. But more importantly, there's a huge environmental aspect. So when I was looking at the ah, ecosystem, subhanallah. at the ecosystem level, I was looking, okay, there's institutes, ministries of defense, hospitals, uh charities uh, ngos that need body bags in the war, in in areas times of war pandemics uh, you know natural disasters and so forth but when i looked at the ecosystem there's a whole environmental impact mm. and by touching in to the ecosystem i got far far more interest from those groups which now want to carry your product and service further up the chain compared to me writing to the ministry of defense asking them to change their body bags to become more environment friendly body bags you see what i mean the ecosystem is now working for me the ecosystem is what i identified and said ah you guys mm. are easier for me to go in there cuz i'm offering you know compostable biodegradable body bags and they love that mm. whereas the ministry of defense is that well it ticks the boxes to say that we are doing something environment friendly but not necessarily a priority for us but when the environment bodies put the pressure on to the ministries and the governments then all of a sudden they want to accept it mm but i mean wow. yeah ecosystem very very key especially for the everyone that um, is looking to do businesses to look around what they're just doing not just what they're doing So it seems to me Sajid that one of the key skills that you need to have is kind of have that curiosity ask questions how does this work like who, what goes on after that what goes on before that is there a problem there can i come in here you know like that, that seems to me like one of the major skills that, that that's that's required in this it does and i think sometimes you need to surround yourself with people who have those skills somebody mm. who's going to be critical you know you see In, in many ways i have people or uh, friends who are very oh what a stupid idea and like, okay why <laughs> why is it stupid oh because you know who's going to buy a body bag i go yeah it's not for the consumer to go on ebay or amazon <laughs> that's, that's a good one yeah <laughs> and I, but the thing is they're limited their thinking is limited yeah However, that's true subhanallah the, uh, their feedback is valuable mm. gives you <clears throat> so the moment you cut off because oh they don't appreciate what you're doing is a moment you actually lack a knowledge or a avenue of understanding that you wouldn't have thought about yourself mm. so bring it on let them come doesn't mean that every opinion you get you just take it and say oh this is it i'm going to change my life and this is going to be you know i can't do my project because of it take all feedback that's the whole beauty of it mm. you know you take the good you take the bad you take what's Sometimes from the good you take a part of that good and sometimes from the bad you take a part of the bad and then you apply it for what makes sense. Wow. Um but it's important, you know. Um so yeah, it's it's not it's it's should keep an open mind. You know, mm. remember they when they criticize your product or your service, it's that's what they're criticizing. They're not criticizing you. Ah, that's a good point. Yeah. And a lot of us we think they're criticizing us. Ah. Oh my god. It's yeah. me. No, no. Why are you taking it personal? It's a product. Yeah. It's an yeah. identity. You know? If right. I said to you, tell me the attributes of this top, this pen top, you say, oh, it's not good because it's this and that. And just because I own it, I I'm not describing feel- Sajid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, well, what's a pen? You're, okay, I understand that. You that's see a good what I mean? point. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's where you have to keep that disassociation from who you are. You are who you are. You are right. perfect. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has created you perfect. Mm-hmm. The problem is you have to just fine tune yourself to be perfect in every aspect. Right now, you don't have the critical thinking. So bring in somebody who does. Uh, If you look at the top, top businessmen, the top uh, athletes, even, you know, the showbiz guys, every single one of them has a coach. They have a mentor. They have mm-hmm. someone that can guide them on their image, on their presentation, on their content, and so forth. And the same way, we need to do the same. 
So someone will have a better gift than you in a certain area. And some will have not so uh, good compared to other people. So you just choose the right people to give you the impact, uh, the input that you need, inshallah. MashaAllah. Wow, this is really good. Uh, yeah, Akhi, uh, maybe if you want to share some closing cl- closing remarks as we close this conversation, inshallah. Oh, sorry, can I add one question? Uh, I have this oh, remaining yeah. question, actually. Yeah? Okay, yeah, yeah. Entrepreneur, yeah? We talk about starting up business and uh, developing it, maturing it into something bigger, yeah? So if we happen to say that we, we made a lot of stumbling blocks and it doesn't go to really what we intended to do, yeah? Uh, how do we throw in the towel or when to do it or should we not do it at all? Yeah, you know what? Uh, it's a good good question. Uh, first of all, get rid of the towel. Then you can't throw anything in. Right? <laughs> okay. And uh, get rid of it. Bismillah, man. You know, the problem is the towel. <laughs> so, uh, no, look, I, I think the question here uh, is a great question because a lot of people have that. The question comes also down to what do you define as a failure? Right? Um Maybe your idea, your concept is too big for other people to comprehend or mm. even appreciate. Mm. Um, and, but because they're not, you're thinking that it's not a success or it won't work. It will work. You just have to keep perseverance. The, one of the key things that as a, a trait for any entrepreneur is consistency. You cannot be an entrepreneur by reading a book on entrepreneurship. The only way you could do it is to practice it. And the best way to practice, it's like a bicycle, right? Once you learn how to ride, you may fall down, you get back up, you keep on riding. And I keep on saying this to all the people I've ever worked with and this and that, you are going to make mistakes. You are going to fail. <coughs> there are going to be moments where you're going to think, you know what, it's not worth it. Mm. If you trip over, just learn to get back up, dust yourself down and bismillah, carry on. You will have to change your strategy. You will have to change direction. You may have to change and engage other people to come on board. But if you believe in what you're doing, then that's the most important thing. And if you think, okay, I won't be able to succeed with this or I'm not going to continue with this, maybe because it has knock-on effects on other areas of your life, your personal life, your family and so forth, or work or financially, then change your model. But it doesn't mean you give up on entrepreneurship. Mm. Go to the next one. Because the lessons you have just learned from the one that you think has failed, those lessons will be so valuable for you in your next one. Because you Mm. won't be doing the same mistakes again. You've learned that. So that's why I say, when you look at failure, failure is an amazing attribute. Because that failure itself, where most people think that, okay, you know, you've lost, you failed. No, 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 no. I've learned, I've gained. Mm. And then you take that and you apply it and make sure that you don't do the same things again, which have caused you in your first fa- failure in your projects. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. I have so, another question. Yeah? Sorry, like, yeah, I yeah. see that if you're if, if you, uh, starting a, a business, maybe the first time or you maybe you're, you're venturing into something else, yeah? Between market-driven, between your passion and your ability, Oh. Which one takes more weightage? And uh, is it the same kind of weightage if, for your first startup or for your second startup? How, how do you, how do you uh, consider this, these three elements? If I was to categorize the three, first thing it would be passion. Oh. Right? Because I have to wake up to wanting to do something. If I don't have that, I won't do it. Right? That's as simple as that. So passion has to be there. If there's no passion in it, then you're just doing something like a robot for the sake of doing it. So... For me, passion has got to be there. Uh, number two, then your own ability. And then it comes down to what time do you have? How can you manage it? And so forth. And you have to be very disciplined. Um, a lot of people ask me this question time and time again. How can I run so many projects at one time? I go, it's because I have, I'm very disciplined when it comes to my organization. Mm-hmm. The more organized you are, the easier it is for you to actually then manage different projects, different businesses, and so forth. Not all of them will be as demanding. Some will be like certain timing, seasonal, um, certain countries, not necessarily 24-7. So it makes it easier in that respect. But it's all about your own abilities as a second thing. Because like I, like I said, if I can't get out of bed and be motivated, there's nothing I'm going to do. I'll be just Netflixing all day. But the moment you have that passion that, ah, oh, I got to do this, then 
you get up and you drive yourself to do it. So, you know, like example, I want to be an author. Okay, how do I become an author? Go do a course, understand. Oh, I went and did a course on author, how to write a book. Then I learned the ability to become an author. You mm. see what I mean? I had the passion to do it. Mm. Then I learned the ability to it. And then I looked at the market aspect of it because the market's always going to be evolving. Mm. You also have to rec recognize the market where you're talking to. Uh, you may be in Malaysia, but the demand for your product and service may be even greater in somewhere like Turkey or in London or UK, mm. or whatever. Right. Right. So don't just think about, about where your initial service is. Think global. Right. Think out of yeah. the box. Think, think in the sense that you're going to, you know, dominate the world. And that's how you start kind of getting that. Um, and, you, and you will learn a lot. You will start looking at different dynamics. You start thinking, ah, okay. You know, mashallah, in this aspect, um, I may not have much of a mind, uh, you know, opportunity with the Malaysian youth market, for example, for a youth product. But I have a far greater opportunity if I did this in London or in Australia. And mm. then it still keeps you driven. And what you do, the next layer would be to find a local partner in those countries and they buy into what you're doing. And then, you know, you build a relationship. So I would say that, it's, that would be my three uh, criteria, passion, ability, and then the market itself. But they are all interrelated. They will move. You may have to kind of consider all of them at one stage. But as long as that flow takes place, inshallah, then I think it should be good. All right, mashallah. Mashallah. I have a question on passion, Sajid. So yeah, you wrote about this in, in the chapter in the book called Finding Purpose. And, and I quote what you wrote from the book. You said, I love to teach, write, coach, facilitate, train. I love bringing people together, delivering new concepts, uh, the ideas to the work that I do. But I have a question. Like, a lot of us are wondering out. A lot of us are out there wondering, like, how, how do you discover this passion? Is it something, you know, we, we some of us, like, we don't even know what my, my my big thing is, you know? So I'm just curious, like, is this something that you've always had or is it something that you kind of discovered and shaped over the years as if you've been trying to, you know, you're going that metaphor again, trying to ride that bike, fall down again. Oh, okay, that's not my passion. Oh, that's my passion. Okay, <laughs> so going there. So I just want to, like, people are people are always confused. Is passion something that's it's already in you since day one or is it something that evolves? So how is it for you? No, I think it evolves because you look at your own um, environment and then you start realizing where either there's a shortage or there's a, a lack or there's a failure or there's a, a, you know, an impact or a benefit that you can make. Um, so first of all, you have to have a certain mindset. Like I said to you, my litmus test is what, everything I do, I have to make sure I have an impact on people's lives for the mm, better. Okay. And then that kind of opens up, you know, this mindset of like where I am, what I want to do. Um, somebody used to say to me, why is it or how is it that you're able to get 300, 400 people to volunteer for you at a conference? And, uh, you know, if you've seen Twins of Faith and if you've seen like the yeah. Being Me and you've seen like the marriage conferences and yeah. arts festivals, where do these people come from? Yeah. I go, the first thing I do with every single volunteer, I give them purpose. Because most people don't have that in their life. And when you have purpose, you do whatever it takes to go and do that. Now, these people may be just there for the day, but the fact they have a purpose, they leave their families, they incur costs to attend, they give their time, they invest in the space, they help promote the events and so forth. Once you can give somebody purpose, then they will, you know, fall backwards to accommodate it. Mm -hmm. Now, coming to passion, naturally, um, I have a, a certain model, and that is, first of all, identify your gift. What is that gift that you have? Right. And once you, you realize, and, and the, one of the best ways to do that is to just basically switch off from the world, your mobile phones and any distractions, get a pen and paper, and just start writing down. What am I good at? Okay, you're good at listening. Okay, you're good at advising. Uh, you're good at creative thinking. Uh, you're good at like, you know, problem solving. Uh, you're good at organizing. You're good at this. You're good at that. And be true to yourself, right? And write down all your things. And doesn't matter how strong or, um, you know, weak they may be, write it down because it's coming to your head. Once you've written it down, scale it. So, okay, out of 10, uh, I'm good at critical thinking. Okay, give that 10. But out of 10, uh, I'm only a three when it comes to like public speaking, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you start scaling your gifts. Now what you've done, walk away from it. 
you know, it's what's known as a break state. Oh. Um, after writing everything down, walk away, go get involved in something else, come back 15, 20 minutes later, look at that, and then say, okay, the ones you've highlighted the highest in the marks, then you say, okay, is this true? Am I who I say I am on this section? Mm. And you might realize your gift is to help people. Right. Okay, now you've got a gift. Now from there, you derive from there what your passions are. Right. Okay, what's my passion? Well, you know, I, I want to help the people who are flooded to have a better life. I want to help the refugees. I want to solve dom uh, domestic violence. I want to stop human trafficking. I want to do this. I want to do that. So when you start identifying the issues that concern you, where you were like, you know what, stuck for, I don't like what's happening in the world, this and that, start choosing one of those topics as a passion that you want to deal with. Mm. Right? And then you start directing yourself from there. And then from there, once you create that whole journey of identity and this and that, that's when you start, you know, building a stronger purpose and other people start seeing that. And this is now, obviously, this, what I've just given you is for something that they do for, uh, as a model for social entrepreneurship. And okay. that's related. But if you were to do the same thing for um, just a business idea, it works exactly the same way. Oh. You see, one of the things I was mentioning also previously was like the difference between an entrepreneur and a social entrepreneur is the fact that a social entrepreneur has to work twice as hard. Both of them have the aim to make a profit. That's what entrepreneurship is. You want to start something, you want to create a business which may generate revenue and make profit. But a social entrepreneur wants to solve a problem in society at the same time, which a normal mm. entrepreneur doesn't care about. Right. So the task of a social entrepreneur is twice as hard compared to an entrepreneur. Mashallah. Making money is easy. Making money and solving a society issue is a, is a challenge. So mm. how much are you willing to challenge yourself? So when I look at myself, I mean, yes, I've done a lot of entrepreneurship, but wallahi, I have never had a more fulfilling kind of involvement compared to dealing with social entrepreneurship issues, be it marriage and relationships, be it engagement for the youth, be it like, you know, building shelters for, you know, people of domestic violence or new Muslim care um, or opening up a school or whatever it may be. It's that impact side of things on social entrepreneurship, which makes it like, you know, gets you out of bed, drives a passion among you. And when people see that, then they reach out and they say, can you help me? Can you advise me? Can you get involved in what I'm doing and so forth? And that's where your networks grow. And, um, you know, alhamdulillah, it takes you to places that you never thought it would have taken you to. So, yeah. Mm. But I also learned as well from, from what you're saying and also what you wrote in the book as well, because passion is something that you kind of have to discover as well, because like seeing you right now and seeing what you wrote in your book, for example, there was one, one chapter where you said you were a quiet kid, you avoided conflicts, you wouldn't speak out in public, you were shy among strangers, you will, you lack confidence in situation outside your comfort zone. I'm like, wait a minute, I can't connect that with this guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it seems to me like, you know, like it's something that you, you kind of uncovered along the way. And, and I think you spoke about this as well. You, you took public speaking courses and that's when you realized eventually, wow, I love this stuff. Exactly. Like I said, the, the gift that you have, there are going to be some things that you're going to be excellent in. You'll be really confident and there's others that you won't. So when I did this simple exercise myself, the areas that I found that I wasn't that strong in, I developed those areas. Mm, so, that's good. And that's it. But mm. the, what's the first step? Self-realization. You ah. realize what you're good at, what you're not good at. And then the areas that you're good at, you see where you can complement and you can work with. And the ones you're not so good at, you start thinking, okay, I need to focus on this because this is going to have a bearing on what I do. Mm. You know, today I, I walk into meetings and before I can even discuss the project itself, I've already built rapport and taken the meeting in a different direction. Um, ah. For example, my business cards, I mean, even the introduction you gave, Faisal, it was the maestro, right? It was not chairman or CEO or director or, yeah, yeah. you know, COO or whatever it may be, nothing like that. Those are titles which are boring titles, even though that's <laughs> what I am. At the end of the day, I'm the maestro and straight away, the conversation, the maestro, oh, or the marriage maestro. Oh, tell me more about that. That sounds it. So automatically, <laughs> you can engage in a whole different, see, and what is that? That's a piece of paper, a card, which has just moved your meeting in your favor. 
and mm. you haven't said a single word of what you're selling or you know you're offering or anything it comes yeah. down to your the, the you know the certain things you're building that rapport it's about what opens up channels what makes a difference into how people perceive you mm. uh, and, and i think that's 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 very key in a lot of the stuff that we do inshallah i love it Anything else from the brothers? Maybe before we move on to the final few questions. No, alhamdulillah. I mean, um, like I said, my 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 input on entrepreneurship is I'm a massive advocate of it. I think everyone is an entrepreneur, but most of us just haven't unleashed that potential amongst within ourselves. Because if you look at back at your own lives, every time you've actually negotiated or you've made a transaction or did a trade as a kid or in your adult years. Um, or, you know, you've kind of, um, I'd say, uh, arbitrated for someone or, you know, mediated. All of these are entrepreneur skills. Mm. We've all done it somewhere in our lives. Problem mm. is, we've let go of it. We haven't focused on it. And if you go back and you focus and you think about those moments in your life, you'll actually realize, hey, yeah, actually, you know what? I'm an entrepreneur. I can do these things. I, and it gives you the self-belief that, Bismillah, you can take on what you want. So um, I actually have uh, this question in my question list, right? Is it is it true that uh, entrepreneurship is not for everyone? But you, you just answer it. I, I yeah, I, I think it is. Um, because yeah. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala doesn't tell us in the Quran that go work for somebody. Find me a job, uh, a verse which he says, uh, go and be an employee. <laughs> what does it say? It says, go and trade. Who trades? Entrepreneurs trade. Business people trade, companies trade, right? Tijara, that's what it is. It doesn't say, you know, uh, work for somebody. Yes, we know there's going to be spectrums. You need, even if you have a business, you need people to work for you in that sense. But that nothing's stopping you from empowering them to do their own business. Mm. Mm. You know, because um, that's 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 when it goes back to sharing knowledge, getting them to kind of, you know, um, develop themselves and, you know, giving back as well in so many different ways. So I think it's important that um, we we have this kind of mindset that, you know, you want to live life with freedom. Mm. Bro, that's what it is, right? All the brothers and sisters out there, unless you want to be shackled down to a nine to five job. A friend of mine I met up a few years ago, he was saying to me, he goes, you're such a lazy bum. I was going, why? He goes, you don't know what nine to five is. I go, you know what? You're right, but you don't know what 24 seven is. <laughs> okay. Yep. You know, that's the reality of it. Yeah. I, I don't leave. My life doesn't stop at five o'clock. My life is 24-7. And I work on a global platform. Mm -hmm. So that means my phone can go off. I wake up in the morning. There's messages galore. I'm having to play catch up with time zones. Mm -hmm. What's happening in Malaysia? Now it's happening in Middle East. Now it's happening in Turkey. Now it's happening in Europe. Now it's happening in North America. Mm -hmm. And I thrive on it. I love it. Wow. Yeah. It, it. It drives me. It gets me up. It gets me going. It opens up opportunity after opportunity. The number of projects that brothers uh, around the world and even sisters have offered me to be part of. Come on, Brother Saji, you could do this. You got a network. You can help me. I'm like, listen, some I can, some I can't. Mm. Right? Because, you know, you, it's one of those things. I, but, yeah, I mean, bismillah. It's, um, the, the, these are all things. The question comes down to is how much are you motivated to do it? Mm. That's the bottom line. Mm. If you're happy with your nine-to-five lifestyle, receiving your salary at the end of every month, paying your bills, paying your taxes, then waiting two weeks until your next paycheck comes again, then bismillah, that's you, yeah. right? But that's when, you're, when you turn 60, you're going to look back and think, you know what, how fulfilling was my life? Mm. MashaAllah. Wow. Okay. So, mashallah, this is really good. Mashallah, Allah mabarak. So, brother Shah, Sajid, So, with with all that you're doing right now, mashallah, with the with the business that you have, the social entrepreneurship that you've been involved with, with the book that you write out in in your mind right now, what sort of legacy do you want to leave behind with all of this? You know, alhamdulillah, that's an excellent question. Again, um, I think for myself, I'm not so worried about um, what what I leave behind. I just I'm more kind of concerned about, can I point at something on the day of judgment and say, I made a difference in this person's life? Mm. You know, that's, that's probably more my kind of way of looking at it. 
a lot of people say, but you know, you do so much. Why don't you promote it more? This now, I'm not a social media person. I don't really go on Facebook and Instagrams and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll share what I have if it's a benefit. Bismillah. Uh, but otherwise, um, the way I look at it is, as long as on the day of judgment, because today you see, I, I can someone can say, oh, you know what? You helped me get married, mashallah. But I want mm-hmm. you now to be a witness for me on the day of judgment. Because if you're not a witness me on that day, then whatever you say to me makes nothing, makes no difference right now. You see what I mean? Yeah. And, and that way, I don't limit myself also to say that I've done it now. I can relax. I can sit back. I don't have to worry about it. I've, I've impacted. Ah, you don't have the we've done it syndrome. Keep exactly. going. We don't have that. I, I definitely don't have that. You know, I, I was in a, um, um, a uh, refugee camp in Dhaka in Bangladesh. And um, we were just outside Dhaka, there's a refugee camp and we were there and we were at the school and we were at the school and the, I was speaking to the brothers and I was saying, so how many meals are you serving? And they said, look, what happens with a lot of parents in the refugee camp, they amputate the, the limbs of the children so they can send them out for begging. And the, and the, the, the deal they have wow. is that, you know, you, you don't amputate the kids in any way, deform them. And at the same time, we will feed the children uh, two times a day and educate them. And so they don't have to go onto the streets and everything. Wow. So the parents have agreed and so forth. So I asked the brother, I go, so how many meals are you serving um, to the children? They go, we serve about 980,000 meals a year. Spana. I'm thinking, wow, it's And it's like seven days a week and so forth and all the number of kids and all this kind of stuff. And as we're standing in this camp and uh, the brother turns around, he goes, yeah, but brother Sajid, you started this. Hmm. And it, it hit me like a ton of bricks and mm. i was like what the he goes yeah because he goes what you did in 2012 and started the project in malaysia today it's around the world and today what they're doing um i started the project charity right in may 2012 and we started off with 50 meals a week mm. and today they're serving over 14 million meals in eight countries around the world mashallah and, uh, you know, I, I, I never stop and say, all right, give me the latest statistics on it. I'm not even involved in the charity. I just meet the brothers who run those charities around the world and everything like that. And mm. it's a nice reminder that what you sow has fruits out there and there are people yeah. benefiting from it. But what mm. I want is not so much that it goes down in history books that Sajid did this and this and that. What I want is the same people who are recipients or the same people who organize delivery of those food and everything <clears throat> to be with me on the day of judgment to say, hey, yeah, we witnessed that this guy did this and this is a result of this. So that's wow. the legacy I want. The legacy on the day of judgment to actually say, okay, fine. Your sins are forgiven. Bismillah, you get into Jannah. So I'll take all the Mashallah. Mashallah. <laughs> Mashallah. Love it. Love it. Allah mabarak. May Allah grant it awesome, to you awesome. and yeah. your family. Amin. Amin. You know, yeah, as a, so I, I just want to share as well, like, so even from my perspective as well, like for you starting up Al Kauthar and uh, Twins of Faith, it's part of like just, just doing it, <clears> Twins <throat> of Faith, convincing people that it can be done, convincing all the doubts that they used to have, convincing all the, you know, all those limiting beliefs that they had. It kind of opened the floodgates after that. Like, there's so many conferences. If you recall, there was one year that people were saying there were <laughs> too many conferences. But subhanAllah, I look at it like, wow, that's great, right? We're getting people like, you know, <laughs> interested in the yep. deen. But the way I see it is like, it's kind of like you tr- you blaze the trail for this. Like, so subhanAllah, I, I kind of have this healthy jealousy for that. I'm like, this is one of the amazing benefits that you get from this, this idea of entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship. And subhanAllah, even like you said, like Allah sends these sort of good news from people who tell you how you've impacted their lives. And I, I, I can imagine like, wow, what's, what, what's waiting for you on the Day of Judgment? So mashallah, that, that's really inspiring. All of our so. Alhamdulillah. I mean, like I said, right now, there's still a lot to do. You don't know when your time's up, so you just keep yeah. on doing what you can. Um, I'm moving to Turkey, inshallah, migrating after 13 years from Malaysia to Turkey. Mm. Um, so one, of the, one of the brothers asked me the other day, he goes, um, what's it like? What opportunities are there in Turkey? I go, this land is untouched. Huh. So it's exactly what Malaysia was almost like 10, 15 years ago. Wow. You know, power in English doesn't exist. Ah. Mm. You've got 82 million people. Now, majority of them are Turkish speaking, but I go, that's fine. My aim is to speak, cater for the English speaking expats. Yeah. The Turkish speaking English audience, just like the Malay English speaking audience. You start from there. Well, you got more. You got more than expats in Malaysia, so you got you got people like me. 
Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, imagine what tech is there to offer. And well, yeah, I'm telling you, so many people who found out I was coming and they, I'm in touch with them there. They're like, when can you start? When's the marriage conference? When's this? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Right. Mashallah. Let me get my feet on the ground. And then, you know, the, the, the dynamics of what we do and um, how we start. But like I said, first thing is to understand the system you operate in. Right. Now, every single one of these are opportunities. I mean, yeah. opportunity to do our opportunity to do khad, opportunity to make a difference in people's life, to improve society, you know, and, and to and to create a legacy. Yeah. Um, so it's it's and and what happens with all of this pro, you know <clears throat> approach, if you you probably noticed through this whole one and a half hour or so that we've been talking, the money aspect is always secondary or even third. It's not mm. a part. Mm. Right. What comes as priority is yeah. passion. Priority is how you make the impact. What makes priority is how you deliver something which is of worth of value. Yeah. The rest, like I said, is all kind of you know dunya matters. The money will come. Mashallah. Wow. So, so since thinking about that, maybe you want to share with us and the listeners as well. What are you currently working on? What are, what are your current passion projects so that maybe we can support that? And maybe you know we want to be part of that as well. And maybe you want to share with us. No, alhamdulillah, I mean, look, the list is going to go on for an hour. I'll be here for another hour talking to you what I'm doing. Okay, just to summarize quickly, um, globally, I'm launching the body bags, the um, uh, biodegradable body bags, inshallah, that's rather than, um, you know, plastic being going into the earth and not decomposing and everything and having a big impact on the bodies that are being put in there and the mm -hmm. ecosystem. Uh, these are biodegradable within 60 days. It goes back to the nature and um, you know insects and the body can decompose properly um, so my aim is at the moment to work with major organizations like the un who ministries health organizations in different countries and roll out the body bags in the uk i've launched islamic car finance uh, from mm, all the lovely. Uh, finance options there is no halal islamic car finance that you can get in the uk uh, which is big surprise to me so i set that up i car finance um, in turkey i am doing hijra for people who are looking to change their environment and space so i started baraka homes um, at the same time i'm doing uh, medical tourism uh, which is causing a lot of brothers and sisters around the world because of the whole pandemic not being able to get the medical treatments that they need um, mm. and turkey is a very well suited place with cost effective cheap uh, surgeries dental cosmetic and major operations and everything um, so that's another thing i'm doing over there heritage tours um, is kicking back off again doing tours around the world from uh, uzbekistan the hadith tour i'm doing a, a global hadith competition where i have about huh. 20 countries involved uh, trying to identify the next generation of scholars Alhamdulillah, wow. I was with the Muaddin uh, of Masjid al uh, when I was on Umrah a few weeks ago. Oh. And they, they've actually want me to bring it to Saudi and so they can hold the final there. But my first aim is to do it at Imam Bukhari's Masjid in Uzbekistan because that's where the promise is. Um, and naturally, Heritage Tours is also going around Turkey. I just did a tour, City of the Prophets, went to Urfa which was a birthplace of, uh, or they say is Mesopotamia. It was an area where Ibrahim al-Islam was thrown into the fire by Nimrud. Uh, it's also the kind of birthplace of Lut al-Islam and it's the resting place and the birthplace, not the birthplace, the maqam of Ayyub al-Islam where the well of Ayyub al-Islam was uh, sprouting from the ground and everything. Um, huge amount of history um, that's taking place in Turkey, Islamic tours and everything. Um, so I'm doing that. And my other next book called The Impact, um, mm. this obviously is all about, uh, you know, identifying entrepreneur skills and traits and uh, life lessons that will help benefit people. But The Impact is about how to start and nurture an, uh, a Dawa project that you have and you want to take it. And Alhamdulillah, over the last 10 years, I've launched 32 uh, Dawa projects of different types, um, both in Malaysia and around the world um, in 12 countries. So Alhamdulillah, that book Inshallah. is a framework um, which guides people on what to do and how to do it. And plus, I'm putting in all these other ideas I've had, which I've never got around to doing. So oh, what? Sorry? I, the ideas of? Uh, ideas of uh, social entrepreneurship. Oh, okay. You've had. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, that I've had that I haven't had the time to do. Mm. So in case anyone out there wants to do them, then Bismillah, they can um, also... Uh, 
take those ideas and put them into application, inshallah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's, that's my life at the moment. And I'm packing to leave. So Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a bit of a handful. <laughs> I mean, I'll grant you success in all of that. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. Wow, yeah. So, so besides, like, from a personal point of view, like, what, what I want to know if there's something that motivates you. So if there's one ayah of the Quran or one hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu or even one quote from the, our pious predecessors, what, what is that one thing that really like gets you like, excited and passionate every day? If there is one. There is. I mean, you know, Alhamdulillah, I think there's, um, there's um, a surah in the Quran, uh, surah Al-Inshara, which means solace. I think it's surah number 94. Oh, Al-Inshara. Um, okay. And I think it's uh, verse number five and six, which says, uh, uh, usri yusra. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats it twice, Indamal usri yusra. And that simply, you know, surely with difficulties, ease. And then with difficulties, surely ease. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying it twice. And I look at life and I look at the projects and I look at myself and I think to myself, okay, there's going to be tests. There's going to be hardships. There's going to be like moments of like give up and walk away. But that ayah, oh, those are two ayah, wow. I mean, those are my anchors. So I love reading it. And every time I do read it, that focus reignites within me that, hey, mm. you know, that one difficulty, you're going to have two easies. Not one, but two. Mm. So that moment that project's not working for you or that, you know, um, thing that you wanted so desperately is not happening for you, don't worry about it. It's going to happen and it's going to happen even better than you expect it to happen. And that's it. Wallahi, that's exactly what drives and that's what makes me kind of, you know, um, really connect. It's an anchor. Uh, Anchors are something like, you know, either there's moments in life or memories or there's a a, a sound or like um, a a vocal that, you know, connects you that every time you hear it or you feel it, there's an energy inside you that just kind of, you know, Reinvitalizes you, and that's for me um, the ayat and the surah itself, mashallah. Yeah. Mashallah, I love it. Yeah, so last but not least, uh, Sajid, how can our listeners get in touch with you, your work, your organization? Yeah, I mean, alhamdulillah, like I said, I'm more than happy out there. Anybody who's interested, they need some guidance, need some help, they need some advice, they want to be part of any of the projects, bismillah. You know, um, I always say the cake is big enough for everyone to have a piece of slice. So why not have some, right? Obviously, a, you know, sugar-free cake. We don't want diabetes or anything. Uh, but, uh, I don't know. I mean, look, I've got so many emails. I've got so many different uh, businesses that it all varies. So right now, I just channel everybody into um, the main one, which is info at uh, sajid-hussein.com. Mm. Um, and that's the email address. Um, and you can just kind of, um, it, the website itself is sajid-hussein.com. Uh, that's the gift website. And then from there, all the other projects are listed and then people can kind of, you know, tell me what they're looking to do or what help they want and so forth. Um, and then Bismillah, you know, uh, if I can help, I, I would love to. Um, and if there's anything of interest, um, like I said, my problem is when there's hard to be done out there, I find it difficult not to get involved. Um, so maybe I won't be fully hands-on, but I'll be, I'd be always like to play some part in it because I'm greedy for the reward. Love <laughs> it. Um, that's the way it is, inshallah. So yeah, Bismillah. Um, that's the best way. Otherwise, they can contact you guys, and then you guys can always forward on my details to them as well. When yeah, <clears throat> sounds great. Mashallah. Wow. So this has been great. Sorry, uh, I mean you think? No, you said Barakallah Fik. Oh, okay, Mashallah. <laughs> Wow. So yeah, this has been great. I have like, actually so many, so so much more things to say. But mashallah, this has been a really great conversation. So um, we we make make dua that Allah Azza wa Jal makes it easy for you and your wife and grants you barakah in your new movement to Turkey, Amen. as well as all Amen. of your projects and past, future, future, past, present, and future. May Allah Azza wa Jal make it a means of success on the day of judgment, and may Allah Azza wa Jal make even this pod- podcast episode as well something we can speak about in the akhirah that can be something yeah. of a means of good khair for, for many, many other people to come. Inshallah. Inshallah. I mean, I mean. Now may Allah give you all success, brothers. I think the podcast that you're doing, <clears throat> mashallah, they are amazing. I've heard a few of them as well in the past, uh, and I think it's a great benefit to the ummah and society, especially at times when you know we are in desperate need of guidance and desperate need of like you know self-reflection and um, direction. Because um, we are going through tough times. The pandemic hasn't been easy for so many people. 
uh, and the Ummah is, you know, kind of segmented around the world. Um, so that the more people, the listeners that can hear and benefit from this, may Allah give you the strength and the ability to continue this work and inshallah take it to new heights as well. Um, so continue Ameen. the good work. And may Allah accept it. Inshallah. Amen. All right, Ameen. closing our conversation, inshallah. So Sajid, in your own words, f- complete this sentence. The key to barakah is? Tawakkal in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wow, mashallah. Because he will fix it for you as long as you believe it. Ah, I love it. Yeah. Love it. Mashallah. <laughs> Jazakumullah khairan. Okay, mashallah. So with that, mashallah, brothers and sisters, we conclude our discussion on this episode, Being a Muslim Entrepreneur. Jazakumullah khairan, brother Sajid, for making your time for our discussion in this episode. And hope you guys find benefit in this discussion as well. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك ونشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت ونستغفرك ونتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته